Tim. Um, it is good to be back in Ann Arbor. Um, so today I'm going to, as Tim mentioned, try and tell you about measuring time on both the ultra-fast time scale, so at very short times, how we measure very, very fast um, events. And then it turns out that there's a connection, which may be a little bit surprising at first, between the way we do that and actually measuring time very precisely, as in the passage of time, how we define a second and so forth. So let's start with time scales. So a time scale that I think probably most people are familiar with is the second, all right? And that's ultimately something we can connect to because it's based on the human heartbeat. Slightly faster time are milliseconds. Um, to give you a feeling for this time scale, uh, your eye works on, up down to time scales on the order of a few tens of milliseconds. Um, that, yeah, that's actually something that's important right now for what you're looking at because this screen is flickering at 60 hertz, okay? And so the fact that your eye can't see faster than that makes it look like it's continuous to you. So this is the level at which human beings could measure events until the late 1800s. And the late 1800s was when the first measurement that I would sort of classify as a general type of something that's ultra fast, simply being faster than what can be measured before, was done. It was motivated, um, so sorry, so microseconds are the next time scale, which they needed to get into. And it was motivated by what you see here, which is a painting of a horse, okay? And this is a fairly old painting of a horse. I actually just found it on wiki art or whatever it is. So I don't even know what it is. But the important question here is, does this look natural to you? Okay. I think it looks a bit unnatural. And the reason is, is both of the horse's legs are off the ground at the same time. All four of the horse's are off, legs are off the ground at the same time. And this is actually a point of major debate okay, as to whether or not a galloping horse ever completely left the ground or not. Turns out this was solved in the late 1800s. It wasn't solved for scientific interest. It was solved to settle a bet, as I understand, a bet in which Leland Stanford was involved. And he paid a, a man by the name of Edward Muybridge to solve this and settle this bet. And Muybridge set up a series of cameras actually at the site, which is currently Stanford University in Palo Alto. Um, and the cameras were triggered by a string, and so as the horse galloped past, he could capture images of them. And as you can see in the upper two frames, the horse's legs are indeed completely off the ground. So it settled the debate to the affirmative, but you see why that painting looks so unnatural, because the painters didn't understand this, and they actually had the horse's legs off the ground when they were fully spread. It actually happens in the middle of the, of the gallop, okay? So this was a, a first example of it. And the point here is, is that we had to go to something which stopped action by taking a very rapid image, okay, and then taking a sequence of them and looking at that sequence to understand the motion, right? So this was done with a camera with a mechanical shutter, all right, and the best you can do with mechanical shutters are sort of on the millisecond, a little bit faster time scale. If you ever owned a good old mechanical camera, the fastest shutter speed was typically one one thousandth of a second or one millisecond. Um, and of course, the best cameras go a little bit faster than that, but not much. So how do we get beyond a microsecond, down into the nanosecond range? And the way we do that is by using short flashes of light. We give up on the mechanical um, shutter and simply leave the shutter open. We make the detector actually very slow. And instead, we use a short flash of light to um, do that. And so you may have seen um, this concept in, in practice, which is a stroboscope. Let me turn this on here. And so the point is, is that what we can do is we can stop the motion of this fan if I can adjust it properly, by synchronizing these flashes of light with the motion. And I don't know if I can find the magic frequency here or not, but you can clearly see that it looks like it's moving quite slowly, faster as I get out of sync. So somewhere there, let's see, I probably have to do this one. There we go. Okay, now it looks like it's barely moving, right? Okay, just to make sure you realize that it really is moving quite fast, right? Okay, so this is the concept that was used. So we can turn the lights back on. However, of course, it was done to a much faster degree 
This is a classic image, okay? This was done by, by a guy named Doc Edgerton, who was at MIT. And here he used a flash of light, which was on the order of nanoseconds. And it's quite remarkable that you can actually see that's a bullet in, a, in air that he's managed to stop the motion of, all right? So this was done in 1964. And about that time is when the technology came on that allows us to actually go better than that. So the next time scale beyond a nanosecond um, is a picosecond, 10 to the minus nine seconds, okay? That's something that probably a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, but where we really get to is actually femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And you'll see here that I've actually added another column here, which is somewhat important, um, which is the um, distance that, can you see that? Yep. The distance that light travels in this amount of time, right? So at a microsecond, it travels 300 meters, so three football fields. A nanosecond, it only travels 30 centimeters, so that's about a foot, right? At a picosecond, it's only, um, sorry, this should be a micrometer. I lost my font here, 300 micrometers, and this is 0.3 at a femtosecond, okay? So keep those numbers in mind because they'll become important later. So how do we get beyond the flash of um, Doc Edgerton's, uh, um, his strobe to go even faster? Well, the important thing that was invented in 1960 was the laser, right? So how does a laser work? You have a medium that has optical gain. That means if you put light in, it amplifies the light. It comes out stronger. And then you cause that light to feed back on itself. So it's the same principle. If I were to take this microphone and put it very close to the speakers, it would squeal. That's oscillation. You get a laser is simply oscillation at laser frequencies. So here's the light. It's bouncing back and forth between these two mirrors, okay? And of course, we want output from this laser. So we have an output beam um, from this mirror here, which is the output coupler, which is partially transmission, transmitting, all right? So just to give you a little language I'm gonna use in the next couple of slides, that mirror, since it reflects completely, is called the high reflector, and this one is the output coupler with a slightly lower reflectivity than 100%. We also talk about the cavity. The word cavity comes from the fact that lasers are actually the second generation. The first was a microwave, um, uh, uh, so-called maser, in which case, literally, the oscillation in, in happened in a metal cavity. In other words, it was a metal volume that was, that was inside uh, a metal block. And an important consideration is that the light must be in phase with itself after one round trip. So after the light bounces back and forth here, okay, it has to have the same phase. And that means that the cavity length must be an integer multiple of the wavelength. So we have this condition right here. Lambda is the wavelength. L is the length of the cavity, and M is an integer. So we have many allowed wavelengths, okay, that satisfy this. And that means that the frequencies, if we recall the fact that the optical frequency nu is simply the speed of light divided by the wavelength, is given by this relationship here. So they're equally spaced, right? Now what happens is not that we need to adjust the cavity length to exactly fulfill this condition, but rather what will happen is the frequency will choose itself to fulfill this condition. And so if we look at uh, one of these we call modes, um, lasing in a laser, this is the laser here, this is the output, we get a um, perfectly CW, uh, continuous wave output, which is unmodulated. Nothing like a pulse of light, which is what we want to achieve to make time resolution. But what happens now if we have two of these modes? So here we have two of these that both fulfill the condition, but they're different by a half wavelength per um, distance here. What we see is a beat note. This beat note is just like you use to tune an acoustical instrument where you hear this, the thrumming sound when two frequencies are close to each other. But this is now a beat note of light. So you can see that look more like a pulse. Now what happens if we have three of these? You can see the output here is looking even more and more like a pulse. And you actually see here, this is the summation inside the laser cavity. You can kind of see a pulse bouncing back and forth. However, there's an important thing as we go to more and more which is that the phases of these modes must be locked together. So we call this a mode lock laser, okay? In this sense that all these f phases are locked, so we get a sh pulse here, and when you go to many, this is now 30, you can see here the pulse bouncing around inside the laser cavity, and the pulse is coming out here. And indeed, you can make these pulses very short. They can get down to the limit of a few femtoseconds, which is just a few cycles of light. So these are the pulses that we use then to, is equivalent to the, the flash of the stroboscope. Okay, this is what happens if you do not have that mode locking, you do not have the phases locked, what you see here is a noisy output. And so this is actually what most lasers will do if you don't do something special to get the modes all locked together. 
So the laser was invented in 1960, and it's fairly remarkable how quickly people started developing these so-called Mohlock lasers. Um, so in 1964, it was first demonstrated actually by a guy by the name of Dick Fork, who was at Bell Labs in the same building where I worked when I was at Bell Labs. Um, and so those first pulses were sort of on the order of 10 picoseconds, and people slowly improved them. There are many different um, technologies, as you can see here. Got the pulses shorter and shorter, at some point, they crossed through a picosecond, sort of got down here into the femtoseconds. And indeed, in the mid-1980s, actually, again at Bell Labs, um, a group led by uh, Chuck Shank managed to produce pulses that were only six femtoseconds in duration. Turns out they had to use some tricks. So there's this asterisk here that they actually took the pulses out of this Modlock laser. They amplified them. They broadened their spectrum, and then they recompressed them. And here is that, that their best result. And actually, they managed to get this result into the Guinness Book of World Records as the fastest man-made event at the time. Okay? It was there for, for a number of years. Actually, somewhere I managed to copy it, but I couldn't find it for this talk. An important thing was is that around the time that they achieved that, a new technology was developed, um, which is the so-called Thai Sapphire Crystal. And you can see here, again, the um, improvements in it. And people made these pulses shorter and shorter. Okay? Um, in the late 1990s, they were getting down to the same regime on the order of five to six femtoseconds. And actually, this curve should be continued here to some extent. They managed to get even shorter than that, um, down to about four femtoseconds, which is basically a, a single cycle of light, which in this, uh, this spectral regime is basically the shortest you can go. Okay, so as I said, these are the short pulses of light that we're going to use to try to time resolve really fast events. Um, how do we do that? It's analogous to the stroboscope, but slightly different. So let me um, show you here uh, just one example. In this case, we're going to do what's called a time-resolved or a transient reflectivity experiment. So here's our laser that's emitting pulses. What we do is, is we have it generate a pulse, and we split it into two copies. Okay? So one copy here we will call the pump pulse. It will come in and excite this sample. Okay? The other pulse reflects off it at the same place, and we detect it. And so what we look at is the change in the reflectivity of the probe pulse based on the fact that the sample has been pre-excited by the pump pulse. Okay? Um, now, how do we get, get actually information as a function of time? Well, the speed of light, which usually you think is quite fast, is actually pretty slow. I already told you that it only travels on the order of one foot in a nanosecond, and here we're talking about femtoseconds. So what we simply do is we delay, change the delay of the probe pulse. We move these two mirrors back. Of course, it's done under co computer control. We now redo the experiment. Okay? This time, the probe pulse is going over a longer path. right? So it will come later. So you can see, it now samples what happened later. Okay? And it doesn't take much of a change in this path length to get a, a delay that's respectable with respect to the, the kind of time scales we're, we're talking about here. So you can basically scan on the order of a few millimeters and get um, picoseconds worth of delay. So let me show you one of the, uh, an early experiment on this. Okay? Um, in this case, what they were looking at was how quickly does a metal melt? All right? So they did this experiment, almost identical to what I sketched here, where this sample was a gold layer. It was just a, a piece of gold. Actually, no, I'm sorry, this one was silicon. It was a silicon, piece of silicon. And what they did is they came in with a relatively intense pulse, and they saw here, so this is a function of time. You can see it's labeled in um, picoseconds here. And they watched how the reflectivity changed. With a low power pump pulse, they actually see a slight decrease in the reflectivity. Because what's happened is you've excited the electrons in the metal. And the excitation of the electrons does change the reflectivity a little bit. But then once the pulse exceeded a certain threshold, you can actually see that all of a sudden the reflectivity started to increase after a short amount of time. Okay? And what was happening is the silicon was melting. It was going from being a crystal to being a liquid. And it turns out that the liquid actually has a higher reflectivity coefficient um, than the, the crystal. And the time it takes from what they mark here is zero to here is how long it takes for the energy that's dumped into this crystal by the pulse to basically cause the, the um, it first heats the electrons, and then the electrons transfer their energy to the actual atoms, and they begin to move around. And eventually, they move so much that they, they break up the crystal, and you, you have a liquid here. So this was an early measurement. And, and now it's turned into something that's almost a routine tool. And so just for example, these are data that was taken in my lab a few years ago. This is the title of the paper. And you see it says nothing about um, 
transient reflection or time scales. We were actually doing a completely different experiment, but we needed to know how quickly our samples were responding. We wanted to see what happened. So this is uh, something called gallium arsenide, a different kind of um, semiconductor. Again, we hit it with a pump pulse. We came in with a, with a probe pulse. And this is sort of uh, what's called pure gallium arsenide. And you can see here, you have a decay time. Notice that this scale is hundreds of picoseconds. And if we put into that either erbium atoms or actually grow it in a different way, you can see a much faster decay. Notice now this is only one picosecond. And this is now decaying on the order of a few hundred femtoseconds. So this shows that sort of these have become routine tools. I'm just gonna, I just gave you one example here, which is doing what we call transient reflectivity. Um, there are many examples of these kinds of experiments. So we do transient reflectivity, transient absorption, which is basically the same idea, except for looking, not looking at the reflectivity of the pump pulse. We look at how much it gets absorbed through a sample. We can actually then go one step further, which is look at how the spectrum of that pulse changes as it goes through the sample and how that happens as a function of time. We can look at a sample where we excite it and then it actually re-emits light and then we can take that light and we can um, measure it as a function of time. So this is what's called time resolved fluorescence or luminescence, depending on whether you're an atomic physicist or a solid state physicist. Um, coherent spectroscopy and photon echoes is something actually that I worked on a lot. I did my uh, graduate thesis here working on photon echoes. This measures a different time scale. It doesn't measure the time scale over which the electrons simply relax, but instead what happens is you excite the system coherently. So you actually excite it where all of the atoms are in phase with each other and you watch how they get out of phase with each other. That's led recently in the last 15 years to a new method called multidimensional coherent spectroscopy, um, which actually is based on, on developments from NMR back in the um, 1960s and 1970s. And another thing that people have been doing recently is time resolved photoelectron spectroscopy. So that's sort of just a zoo of um, things that you can do um, with these ultrafast pulses. And now we can go even faster, actually. Um, we can make the next level. Um, oh, so I just wanted to mention here. So just to give you a feeling for how short a femtosecond is, okay, what these time scales are we're talking about, a, fem a femtosecond, it, the ratio of a femtosecond to a minute is the same as the ratio of a minute to the lifetime of the universe. Okay, so in other words, if you think about that, these time scales we're looking at are sort of like less than a minute compared to how long the universe has been around. I, that's two things that are sort of inconceivable to me, but it just shows you just how short the time scales are. And now people can go even faster. They can make outer second pulses. So how do they do this? Let's see if this movie's gonna work. Um, So this is a movie I found that somebody else made. So hold on, let's see. Okay, so what you do is you start with a short laser pulse like I've been talking about, and you excite a gas of atoms. It's actually in a vacuum chamber. And what happens is this short pulse actually rips, in, rips electrons off of these atoms. So here's gonna show you the interaction with one. So it rips the electron off, and that electron then is accelerated by the laser field back it actually usually goes back and forth like this. And what happens is it emits a very short pulse um, of light, which you can see is at a much higher frequency. So these pulses of light are actually in the soft X-ray region, okay? And it repetitively does this, okay? So that this chain of pulses come out. An important point is, is that it's coherent. So they add together for each atom as it goes past, right? And So now if we, we're gonna zoom out to see that it again. So we look at the, all of these high harmonics coming out. And if you look at the spectrum of them, which this is what it shows you here, what you'll see are much higher frequencies and they end up being multiples of the frequency of the original laser. So we see this here. So that actually shows you what the image looks like and they come out. But the key thing is, is that um, if you saw, the individual pulses of this high harmonic light were actually quite short themselves. So each one of them is actually a pulse that's only a few attoseconds in duration. So an attosecond is a fraction of a, um, a femtosecond. I'm gonna skip that, that was my backup with the movie, didn't work. And people use these now. So this is a, a demonstration that I always thought was quite impressive. So here they've actually made a, um, an attosecond pulse and then they're using it to excite electrons and then get my laser pointer back. 
They're using it to excite electrons, and then the electrons are getting accelerated by this regular laser pulse here. And if they look at the, um, if they look at the energy of the electrons, they can actually map out the oscillations of the laser pulse itself. So in some ways, this is now like an oscilloscope that you're used to seeing for measuring electronic waveforms, but it's actually operating at the frequencies of light. Okay? And this is a fairly new technology. The important thing here is to actually be able to isolate a single one of these pulses here, which you can do by making the driving pulse short enough, or there's some other tricks that are people are developing to use that. So this is still sort of on the cutting edge. People are trying to understand exactly how you can um, use this to probe physics on the, on the same time scales. Note here that I already said that the short pulses that are only a few femtoseconds are at the limit of what you can do in the optical regime. So in order to make these shorter pulses, as I said, they've had to actually go into the UV, uh, extreme UV or the, the soft x-rays to do it. Okay, so let's shift gears here a little bit and talk about the other part, which is actually measuring time precisely. So how long is a second or a day or something like this? Let's think about how we've measured time historically. So how did it start, right? It started with simply keeping track of the number of days, okay? So that was, that was sort of the beginning. And then watching how the sun move across the sky. So all of this is based on the rotation of the Earth. People came up with better ways. This is called an astrolabe for measuring the sun more precisely. This is a water clock, an Egyptian water clock. This is a, a clock, I forget the name of it, that was developed in the um, Renaissance, medieval times in Renaissance. Again, you have a, a rotating um, mechanism here and a gear work. And of course, this is the escapement that's typically in, in your watch, right? So what are the elements of a clock, right? What you need is a repetitive event, right? That's what we call the oscillator. And some method of counting it. Right? So in the beginning, our repetitive event was the Earth, right? and we counted it simply by counting rotations of the day or by watching it on a sundial. The next step was something like a pendulum clock, right? and again, you had to develop the clockwork to count the, the number of oscillations of the, of the pendulum. Of course, the next step, which is quite common, is a, a, a quartz oscillator, which is often used in a wristwatch. And today, the very best clocks are based on a cesium atom here. So that's the number of transitions in a cesium atom in one second, all right? So an interesting question is how do we define time, right? And of course, it started out by simply define, being defined by the day. As I said, it was motivated by, by the human heartbeat, but we just ultimately decide, decided that we would define it to be 60 seconds in an hour and 24 hours, sorry, 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in a day and 24 hours in a, in a day. And so, even then, there's actually a controversy, which is what day do you use? Of course, the natural thing is the solar day, but there's another day which is slightly different, which is ba based on measuring the rotation of the Earth with respect to the fixed stars, okay? But the Earth is actually not a very good clock, and people realized this about 100 years ago. It's slowing down due to tidal fric fri friction, so the, the day is slowly getting longer. It actually fluctuates. Fundamentally, it's what you call in the metrology community a physical artifact. It's something that you're trying to measure um, and what we like are things like quantum transitions. And so in 1967, there was an international agreement to redefine the second to be exactly 9 billion, 192, is that, no, 9 trillion, 192 billion, no, no, I got that wrong, 192 million, 631,770 periods of the transition between two hyperfine transitions in cesium, okay? So that is our current definition of um, time. This frequency is in what we call the microwave regime. So the question is, what makes a, a good clock, right? So what we want is an oscillator, and we notice there's a trend here, that we went to higher and higher frequencies um, to make our, our clocks better. So right, so in the beginning, the Earth, we know frequencies once a day, a pendulum clock, sort of on the order of a second, quartz crystal is on the order of kilohertz, and then an atomic microwave transition, right, which is in, in the microwave regime. So why is that true? So let's just think about this. If we want to measure a time period, so there's some time period here, and you have some oscillating phenomenon you're doing, typically your uncertainty is going to be proportional to the period of the oscillation. And you can think of that in the simplest picture, which is you simply count the number of zero crossings. So for example, you count the number of times this thing crosses zero, um, which is in the middle here, going in the positive direction, in this case it's two, so your uncertainty is sort of actually 50%. You don't know, you could have one oscillation in your time period or two. 
Of course, you can subdivide that, but fundamentally, you always have it be proportional to the, um, the period. So if we go to um, shorter and shorter periods, in other words, higher and higher frequencies, our uncertainty gets less and less. So you can see the fractional uncertainty here is compared to the time you're measuring itself is smaller, and we can go even faster than that. So a logical thing would be to ask, can we go instead of using a microwave transition, okay, which has a frequency of nine gigahertz, perhaps to an optical, free, optical transition. All right, so an optical transition would have a frequency, if you remember the frequencies I put in there, it's on the order of 100 um, terahertz. Okay? So it's on the order of 10 to the fifth higher than the microwave frequency. Um, the problem with trying to use an optical transition, it turns out that the fundamental fluctuations are about the same, but the problem is how do you count those, those cycles? So people have talked about this for 30 years or so, but how do you actually count it? What is your clockwork mechanism that counts those optical frequencies and translates it into something useful, all right? So you might say, well, since this is a very fast frequency, can we use these really short pulses? And at first, this seems like a really stupid idea. For the following reason, there's a connection between time and frequency. So on the left here, I show you a pulse in time, okay? On the right, I show you what it looks like in the frequency domain, what its spectrum looks like, all right? So let me make this pulse shorter. What you see is in the spectrum domain, it gets wider, right? And I make it even shorter, it gets even wider in the spectrum domain. So there's basically, if we look at the width of these two, right, there's a relationship between them. It's like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The width in the time domain times the width in the frequency domain has to be greater than some constant, which is basically one. So that says that what we want to do, as I said, we want to measure a frequency very accurately. That's what a clock does, is we have a, an oscillator with a fixed frequency. And so the idea that a really short pulse of light would be helpful for this is very counterintuitive, okay, because of the fact that a short pulse of light intrinsically needs a lot of different frequencies, so it's ill-defined in frequency space. But there's actually one thing that was overlooked in this thinking, and this thinking probably held for um, close to 40 years amongst most people in the laser community until about uh, 2000 or so which is that these lasers, as I showed you, they don't put out just one pulse. If they put out just one pulse, this would be perfectly true. They actually put out a train of pulses, okay? And so let's look at what happens if we look at the spectrum of a train of pulses. So here's, again, a single pulse like I just showed you. Here's its spectrum. I've zoomed in on it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a second pulse at a fixed time away. You now see the spectrum shows these oscillations. So these oscillations are actually the interference, these dips here, are the destructive and constructive interference between these two pulses. We add a third pulse. You notice that you're starting to see spikes, a fourth pulse, and so on, and the spikes are getting narrower and narrower, right? And so the point is, is these are actually very well resolved in frequency. Indeed, the longer we measure for, the better they get resolved, as long as the phase relationship between these pulses is very well maintained. And indeed, these pulses coming out of these lasers are all copies of the same pulse inside the laser that's circulating. So they do have a very well-defined phase, phase relationship. So perhaps we actually can use these to, to help address this problem. So another way to look at this is the fact that these lasers make, as I said, they make a train of pulses, okay? And the repetition rate of the train, I haven't told you, but it's on the order of a nanosecond, okay? A nanosecond is one over a gigahertz, okay? and nine gigahertz is the frequency of a cesium clock. So in other words, if we look at the frequency of this pulse train, it's comparable to a cesium clock. The underlying optical frequency is depicted here. Okay, this is very much not to scale. The pulses themselves look like this, but the point is, is if we can somehow relate the underlying optical frequency, the blue, to the time between the pulses, we actually would now have the connection between the optical frequencies and the radio frequencies, which is what we want, because once we can connect the optical frequencies down to radio frequencies, then we know how to measure and count the radio frequencies. Okay? Um, so in this sense, the laser is what we call a frequency divider. Right? Now, if the pulses look like what I used in the previous slide, where they were all identical to each other, so the actual electronic waveform, which is the red part here, was identical, okay, then actually this would be pretty easy. But it turns out that there's a subtle point, which I show you here, which is the pulses are not all identical to each other. Each one has a slightly different phase. If you look at this, you can see that the peak of the red does not line up with the peak of, of the black in this case. It pretty much lines up here, and then it slips be, be, beyond it there.
So this has to do with um, something that we call the carrier envelope phase. It's the phase between those two, all right? And in most cases, this phase doesn't matter because what we measure in optics is an intensity, and the intensity is just proportional to this red envelope here. But it does matter in this case because what we're doing is we're interfering with successive pulses. And the reason it varies is because there's two different velocities that occur for light. So one is called the phase velocity. And if you look at this pulse going here, you'll see that the fringes are actually slipping through the pulse, okay? Because there's an overall envelope that's moving with what's called the group velocity, which is a slightly different velocity than sort of, if you will, the, light, the intrinsic light waves themselves that make it up. And why does this matter? Well, in any laser, we're gonna have material in it. At the very least, remember I showed you there was a gain medium, and that gain medium has what we call dispersion, which means that the phase and the group velocities are different. And so if we look at what happens, here's our pulse circulating in the cavity, we make a copy of it every time it hits right here, and you see these two copies are now different from each other. They actually have a different electronic waveform. There's this phase slip between the successive pulses. And so we need to take that phase slip into account when we calculate the spectrum, which I did not do in that simple um, example I showed you. And so when we do this, so here is our pulse train where we see there's a phase slip from pulse to pulse. These electronic, the blue part is not quite the same. If we now look at the spectrum, so again, we have this very broad spectrum, which is basically the spectrum, um, the inversely proportional to the width of the individual pulse. That's what I showed you, the, the connection between temporal width and spectral width. But because we have the interference, we have these sharp lines underneath. They are spaced here by the time, one over the time between the pulses, but they're slightly offset from being exactly integer multiples of this by an amount we call the offset frequency F naught. And that frequency is related to this pulse to pulse phase shift here. Okay, so let me try to um, convince you that this is the case by playing for you an acoustic version, an acoustic pulse train. So you can hear this with your own e ears and believe that my analysis is right. So first what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna play an acoustic train for you where the carrier frequency is four kilohertz. So that's a fairly high frequency to your ear, okay? But the repetition rate, the time between pulses is 100 hertz. That's a fairly low frequency. So the A that you're used to for, for tuning a piano is 440 hertz. So this is lower than that. And in this first pulse train, all of the pulses will be in phase, so there's no phase slip between them as I show you there, okay? So let me play that. Oh, wait a minute. You hear that? So what you're actually hearing is not really the four kilohertz so much as the low frequency component. So if you look at this comb, it's the ones down in the tail here. All right, so now I'm gonna play you the same train that everything is the same except the phase is flipping by pi by 180 degrees from pulse to pulse. So it's where it would actually flip from the first pulse to the last pulse in one pulse interval. Musicians in the room? Anybody have perfect pitch? Could you hear the difference? Okay. Sometimes you can. It actually depends on the low frequency um, response of the, of the system. So to help you out, I'm now gonna play it where the first five seconds has the pulses all in phase, and the second five seconds, they're actually flipping phase um, from pulse to pulse. And halfway in between, you should be able to hear the transition. You hear that where it shifted? Okay, so hopefully that convinces you that we've actually done the math right. If you have any doubt, uh, sorry, I got cut off. I actually had a reference here. You can go look at the math for yourself, okay? But hopefully that convinces you that th this effect really exists. And exactly the same thing happens in, in the optical regime. All right, so the point is what we need to measure here now is both the repetition rate of the laser, that's a, a frequency we can actually measure pretty easily, but we need to measure this offset frequency as well to know what the spectral components of all of these are. So how do we do that, okay? And it turns out there's a trick that we dub self-referencing that allows us to do this, okay? What we do is we compare the comb to its second harmonic. So what does that mean? Turns out there are certain crystals you can put an intense laser pulse through and it will double the frequency of it. All right, so that's called second harmonic generation. Who knows where that was first demonstrated? Here, Here right. Over in Randall Lab in the basement by Peter Franken, he did that in 1961, the year after the laser was, was developed. It's now a standard tool. There's actually a lot of lasers that use that. 
But what we're going to do is we're going to take this very short pulse and we're going to run it through one of these second harmonic crystals. Okay? So what happens is we have here the fundamental spectrum on the left. It's this, again, comb of frequencies. And I've purposely made it not perfectly Gaussian or anything, just to, to sort of show you that it doesn't matter. And on the right is the second harmonic spectrum. So what happens after we run it through this, through this second harmonic crystal? And the important thing to look at is this little bit right here where they're overlapping with each other. Okay? And if we look at those comb lines, so again, the equation we had on the previous slide is the frequency of each comb line is an integer times the repetition rate plus the offset frequency. Okay, we frequency double that, we simply multiply that by two. If we look at the closest comb line on the very high frequency tail of the fundamental spectrum, it's in general gonna be another integer m times the repetition rate plus the offset frequency, okay? However, if you think about it, the closest comb line is gonna be the one where m is equal to um, 2n. That's going to be the closest to this one. So if we take that little bit there where they overlap and we illuminate a photodetector, we're going to get a beat. Again, the kind of beat I was talking about where you're used to in acoustics. And if we work out the frequency of that beat, it's quite simple algebra here, <coughs> excuse me, where we see that it's, this is the comb line on the low frequency part of the second harmonic spectrum. This is the one on the high frequency part of the fundamental. We multiply that out, it's just the difference in the offset frequency, or just the difference of the offset frequency, okay? So this allows us to measure it. There's one catch, which is that we need what we call an octave of bandwidth. Exactly the same definition in music. That means that the frequencies here cover a factor of two from here to here. And even the very shortest laser pulses that we had back in 1999, 2000, didn't have that much bandwidth. It turns out people can now do that directly out of a laser, but at the time, they couldn't. Fortunately, um, there was a, another development that came out in 1999-2000 by a gentleman by the name of Janinda Ranka at Bell Labs in Murray Hill. He took short pulses and he launched it in a piece of optical fiber. You're looking at the, the front face of the fiber. And it was very unusual fiber. So normally the fiber that we, that's used in telecom consists of glass with two different um, constituents. So you have a core with a slightly higher index of refraction because you've actually doped it, typically with germanium, and then a cladding. In this fiber, what you see here is there's these little tiny holes. Those are actually air holes. Those are little micron-sized air holes in there. And in the middle, there's one where that hole is not there. And so this is the core. He actually launched light into there. He launched 100 pump second pulses. And stunningly, what he got out was this incredible, beautiful rainbow you see here. So actually, the laser he's using has a color here that you can't barely see with your human eye. You got all these colors coming out there. Very broad spectrum. So this turns out it's easily an octave-spanning spectrum. This is actually some results from my lab back in Jilla. So this is our initial pulse, about a 15 femtosecond pulse. This is the output of the fiber. You can now see that these two guys here actually um, differ by a factor of two quite easily. We learned to optimize it actually here. This is a microscope objective focusing into this fiber. And you can see it's actually literally glowing white after this is about one centimeter wide here. So this gave us a route to do that. All right, so how do we use this actually to measure frequencies? Um, um, it's the first step towards building, building a clock. What we do here is we take a broad spectrum, okay? We have some laser that we want to know the frequency of. It's typically a very narrow band laser. It's typically locked to some atomic or molecular transition. And we measure a beat note, okay, between it and the nearest comb line, all right? So that's the difference here. This is a frequency which is a radio frequency. It's easy to measure using standard electronics, okay? We measure this repetition rate, again, a radio frequency, relatively easy to measure. A $2,000 frequency counter will do it. We measure this offset frequency using that self-referencing. We now have measured three radio frequencies, and from those, we can actually determine the frequency of this unknown laser, okay? So why was that a, um, such a dramatic step forward? What you have to understand is how it was done before that, okay? It was done using something called a frequency chain, Right, you started here, so this is a cesium clock. You actually used nonlinearities in something called a klystron. Okay, klystron is actually what makes the microwaves in a microwave oven intense. Then you use nonlinearities in these incredibly fast diodes. You ultimately got to uh, molecular lasers. Actually, sometimes they use alcohol lasers up here to different kinds. And finally, at the end of the day, you measured one frequency. You wanna know how hard this was? This is a diagram of the best one that was probably ever built. It was built in the Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt in Braunschweig, Germany. That's the equivalent to the uh, National Institute of Standards Technology here in the US. 
This shows you the schematic. So down here is the cesium clock. They had an incredibly good cesium clock. All the way through this, each one of these is what we call a phase lock loop. It's really hard to make each one of these work. There's 12 of them in here. And at the end of the day, they measured one optical frequency here. Okay. This took up three rooms in their, in their laboratory, and it typically would take four or five PhDs tweaking, and they'd make, maybe make one measurement a year using this setup. All right. So it's pretty hard. So with frequency combs, we turn them on, we make those three RF measurements, and now we can measure, because they're very broad, we can measure whatever standard you want, okay? And not only that, you can use some nonlinear optics tricks and actually measure different frequencies as well. So it really made it easy, and indeed, my uh, example is, I said that at the PTB, the Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt in Germany, they required five PhDs to make this thing work. I actually had a second year graduate student in Boulder who managed to make an optical frequency measurement using this scheme. So you can see the impact of that if you look at historically uh, measurements that have been made. So this is, uh, was compiled by my colleague Leo Holberg. So this is actually the first frequency chain. It was built at the then NBS in Boulder. It was actually part of the redefinition of the meter. Okay. These were the IR frequencies, then they do optical frequencies. You can see that here about 2000, all of a sudden the number of measurements and the uncertainty, so this vertical axis is uncertainty, the number of measurements went up and the uncertainty went down quite a bit. So that's associated with the um, introduction of, of frequency combs, all right? And so there's an interesting question here, which is um, the fact that the uncertainties are now getting the, as good as the very best cesium microwave clock. So the cesium is the accepted definition of the, of the second, and so actually as of about 2005, these measurements were actually, the uncertainty in the measurement was comparable to the uh, uncertainty in the, in the source clock itself. So what do you do when that happens? Now, you, you can't say that the, you're making a measurement that's, that's limited by the measurement process. It's actually limited by how well you fundamentally are defining things. Let me give you an analogy. So this is measurements of the speed of light. Um, the first one on here is made in 1880. Anybody know who made that measurement? Michelson is correct. This is the measurement made, made by Michelson. Okay, this is a measurement made at the same time as this measurement. Okay, um, uh, in, this is actually made by Jan Hall in Boulder, in an abandoned gold mine of all places. Um, and so at this point, this measurement was so good that compared to the, this length standard at that point, it was better than that. So what happened? Um, we basically redefined things, so we defined the uncertainty go to zero. Right? Because we define the speed of light based on, um, a, as the definition of the meter. Right? So that's what's happening now. People are now beginning to look at um, redefining the definition of the second um, in terms of optical transitions instead of the cesium transition. Right? So the idea is to build an optical atomic clock. This shows you sort of a sketch. So the point is the frequency comb is a gear work that connects the very high frequencies at optical regimes to lower frequencies in the microwave regime. And what I've been talking about is optical frequency metrology where we start from the cesium clock and we multiply up to get to the optical regime, right? In an optical atomic clock, you actually run this backwards. You would call this the source and you use the gear work to actually generate a microwave frequency or radio frequency that would be useful as a reference, okay? So these were some early demonstrations um, shortly after combs were generated or, or, or demonstrated. Um, I want to show you one that's um, actually probably one of the best so far. It's, a, it's called a strontium lattice clock. You have ultra-cold <coughs> atoms of strontium that are, that are confined in an optical lattice. Okay. This is actually a measurement of the line width of that. It's quite remarkable. This is hertz, but this is at hundreds of terahertz um, central frequency. And if you look at the uncertainty here, it's come down here, so it's at less than 10 to the minus 16 level okay, if you average for long enough. Um, and indeed, if you remember the plot I showed you, the best cesium clocks are, were out here 10 to the minus 15. They're now actually in the high 10 to the minus 16s as well at comparable averaging times. But they've really gotten to that point. Um, so there's, um, I'm going to skip this. Another example was done um, at NIST in Boulder by Dave Weinland's group. He's an expert in doing ion trapping. Now, instead of using strontium atoms in a lattice, what he actually used was um, single ions. They call this a logic clock because there's actually two different kinds of ions. It turns out there's one that's very good as a clock and another one that's very good as interacting with light. Again, you see this frequency comb here. 
And in this case, the problem is, is that the uncertainty of the cesium clock, its fluctuations are too big, so they actually compared clock to clock. So this is actually comparing to what's called a mercury clock. And what I want to point out in you, to you here, this is what's called the error budget, all right? And something that's significant in here is the gravitational redshift, okay? So there's something called universal coordinated time. The French acronym is UTC. And it is made by uh, the International Bureau of Weights and Measurements, just outside um, Paris, France. Takes uh, reported time from, any di from many different places around the world and uses them to figure out what the current time is, okay? And so anybody can report. If you have a wristwatch and you want to report the time in your wristwatch, that's fine. You can report it to them. They weight it by how accurate your measurements are, so probably the weight that will come into UTC is negligible. Um, but NIST, of course, had one of the best clocks and they report it, and so they've always had to put in a gravitational redshift because Boulder, Colorado is at about 1,800 meters above sea level, and that's actually a significant shift due to general relativity. Now, at this point, the gravitational redshift is so important here, okay, it's a, it's a significant fraction, that actually I don't have a, an image here, but these guys did a follow-on experiment where they built two of these side by side, it might even be these two clocks, and they went down to Home Depot and they bought some jack stands and, and pneumatic jacks and they jacked their optical table up by a meter and they could actually see a difference in how fast those two clocks were ticking due to a difference of height of one meter, all right? So this kind of shows you the level these clocks have gotten to, so you could turn that on your head and possibly use it for measuring the local gravitational potential, um, but it means that actually these kinds of things are gonna become a, a dominant uncertainty. The other thing that's it's impressive probably to those who know the physics in detail, but there's another correction in here which is actually due to the stark shift from black body radiation. So the stark shift is something that wasn't seen until people had lasers, and now you don't even need a laser to see it, you can just see it from the background black body radiation. Okay, so with that, um, I wanna just uh, finish up here, and uh, if you wanna read some more about um, Frequency combs, this is an article that I co-authored in Scientific American. It was in the April issue of, um, in 2008. Um, so it, it talks about the frequency comb part of that. And with that, I thank you for your attention.